All right. Hello. Welcome, everybody. Or welcome back to our, our first talk. Uh, I'm Ricky Burrell. I'm one of the co-organizers of the seminar series, along with Mike Gavin. Um, it's a pleasure to have with us today Dominique uh, Marie Dubich on this. Um, our seminar series is ongoing for the rest of the semester, so I just wanted to give a brief plug. Uh, next week is Maria Elena Huamachano uh, coming to us from Brown University. She'll be next week, same time, same place, except Thursday, instead of Tuesday, so next Thursday here. Um, I encourage everybody to come to the rest of the speakers because we have a really incredible lineup. Um, it'll be great to have you here to, to listen to their work, um, support them, and amplify their voices, which I think is the important part. Um, so without much further ado, um, I want to introduce Dominique. Um, it's been a privilege for me uh, to know her as a colleague and a friend. Um, and I have to say I've learned a lot about some of the ways in which we can improve our research. Uh, by knowing better, we can do better research, more ethical research, um, and be more inclusive uh, in the communities that we work in. Um, so thank you very much for joining us today, Dominique. Thank you. Thank you for that introduction. Um, I'm really honored and I'm really grateful to be part of this seminar. I was able to hear Camille Danji at the last talk and I'm just really glad that this is taking place and the next speakers that are coming, you should definitely try to attend. Um, so because of the, the topic that we're covering, I feel like it's important in addition to sharing my research and data to share some stories with you about my experiences as an indigenous scholar, as a first generation in my family in higher education and just some insights that we can share from those experiences. So in order to do that, I'm going to begin like this. Mapueka, Taigue, Tainoti, Dominique Aita, Naru, David Chavez, Diri, Poriquen, Arawaki, Waro, Taino, Daka, Hahom. And this is the language that my ancestors in the Caribbean would have greeted the, the first newcomers to the islands. And we're pretty famous, uh, you probably know, for discovering Columbus. But you probably heard that story in the reverse. And this is, uh, oh, in addition to being indigenous to the Caribbean, I'm also a PhD student here. And Mike Gavin, Dr. Mike Gavin is my advisor. And these images are from the field work that I've been undertaking in my family's native community in Boriquen, which is our original place name for Puerto Rico, and Quisqueya, which is the original name for the island, part of the island known as Dominican Republic. So for the past uh, three, four years now, I've been developing and then implementing a community-based climate research field model. And so I'll talk a little bit about that too. But first, this is a, island, or a map. This map is from the Decolonial Atlas Project, and it has the indigenous place names of the islands in the Caribbean. And some of these names still persist to today, but they're slightly adapted. So we have Haiti, which is now Haiti, and Jamaica, Jamaica, and Cuba, still Cuba. And you may have been really familiar with this region more recently during this past severe hurricane season. So in this image, this Doppler image from NOAA, the eye of the hurricane is passing through my family's home community in the rural south of the island and through the two field sites where I work. And as of now, they're going over five months without power as a result of this past season. But the extreme weather events like this aren't really new to people in the Caribbean. Because before Irma and Maria, we knew Guabancé. And it was from Guabancé, who's depicted here, through the forces of wind and the forces of water from which Huracan was born. And it was from Huracan that that term hurricane that we use now to describe these climate and weather systems was born. So you see the indigenous people in this region have been observing Earth's natural weather systems for a long time. And these weather systems are embedded in our indigenous language. And these ways of knowing are embedded in our practice. This is Randal Alasea of the community of Sidra, and he's one of the traditional knowledge holders that we work with in our study where we engage youth and elders and farmers and people who are close to the land as researchers. And when I look at Mr. Alasea, I see one of our first scientists. And I see one of the first monitors of change on the land. And I see that indigenous knowledge that has been passed down in our community maintained in practice and sustained in the way that he grows food for his family and for his community. So here he's harvesting indigenous tobacco seeds that have been in his family for as long as they can remember. 
And the type of agriculture that he's doing here of rotating crops and intercropping and the way that he's working with the landscape to grow this food and these indigenous crops is now deemed something called climate smart agriculture. And there's these other terms that I've heard that are kind of young and new to science like sustainability, like deep ecology and biomimicry. And I'm thinking, you know, these are new terms, but they're very ancient concepts. And they're concepts that are being um, implemented in practice by our first scientists, like Mr. Alisea. So this knowledge is embedded in practice in our oral history, in the stories of Guamanse, in our languages and in our culture. But the really interesting thing and the story I wanted to share is that I've had this experience going through the K through 12 education system and then doing my undergraduate degree in earth sciences and then now into my PhD here in human dimensions of natural resources where I hear this persistent narrative throughout every field of science that I learn, throughout every lecture, every PowerPoint, every historic and interpretive plaque, I hear the same narrative and the narrative goes something like this. It says, this person, usually European American, usually male person, was the first person to explore this canyon. The first person to discover this species and to classify this genus or this cloud system or this geologic system. The first person to name this place, Fort Collins or Kashlapuder. And so often when they're doing this naming and when they're building these systems of knowledge, they're named after themselves or after women who they loved or men who they loved or after politicians who funded them. And you can see that reflected in the landscape and you can see it reflected in the science. And so it's been really interesting as I hear this narrative, as I'm reading it from the time I'm a little girl and a, and a scientist in my own way and to the time now in graduate school, I'm reading these stories and I'm thinking to myself, these are alternative facts. <laughs> because in every single place that I was learning about, I knew from experience and from my own community and other Native communities I had lived and worked with as a climate researcher and as a scholar and as a granddaughter and as someone who was learning from all these different scientists like Mr. Alisea, I knew that they had names for those places and ways of describing that land, intimate ways that were embedded in language and embedded in practice. And they've virtually been invisible in the sciences that I've learned and they've rarely been acknowledged. And it's really interesting because there are instances where you can see a hint or a glimpse of that field, local field guide telling them where that species was or where to find that bird or how to reach that place or you know, guiding Lewis and Clark to map that landscape. But it's just barely mentioned and it's not acknowledged in a way that we acknowledge our data sources and scientists you know, here in academia. And to me, that's been just always right here, right in my face every year. So it's been a really interesting experience. And I think that having those experiences has really guided me to do the research that I'm doing now, because as a scientist, I'm thinking, you know, we have these really diverse, complex challenges that we're facing. And it's beneficial to have as many sources of knowledge as we can. And as we're looking at it right now with the sciences, the way we're learning it, we have this this one view, this one main dominant perspective that we're looking at whatever problem or issue with. And in the US alone, we have, as of this year, 573 federally recognized tribes. And that's not counting state recognized, that's not counting Native Hawaiian or US territories like my own families. So that's just within the US border, not even north or south of the border. 573 with unique languages and unique knowledge systems. So we have this one view that we have access to in our textbooks and in academia that comes from a small population. And it's not like there's two sides. It's not like there's Western academic science and then indigenous science, which we hear a lot, or indigenous traditional knowledge or native science is terms you might hear. But it's this whole um, you know, infinite number of perspectives and when you turn that perspective, you might see something different. You might see a different angle or you might see different details that you couldn't see before. And as of right now, we're not necessarily accessing or viewing the world through those other lenses, the way that it's set up. And so I think that's a disservice 
to all of us as scientists, and that we have some exchanges. You know, I often think back and I kind of wonder, you know, what if at that time in 1492, our ancestors had a stronger immunity to these new pathogens? Or what if that first and second wave of colonization, what if they weren't so hungry for land and gold and labor and souls at that time? What kind of exchanges might have taken place? And would it have taken us so long to, to come upon these terms and concepts like sustainability and to build technological innovations you know, with those concepts embedded within them? I often wonder that what that would look like. And it may be about 500 years overdue, but the really cool thing is you're all here, we're all in this room, we're having this conversation, and we have this opportunity to have this exchange now. So I don't know about you, but I'm really excited to be a part of it. And what I'll share with you today from my research is a small piece of that, a small contribution to fostering that exchange. And I'm out of breath and my voice is dry, so I'm gonna have some tea before I start. <laughs> So the big question for this study is how are climate research studies engaging indigenous knowledge systems? But more importantly, how are they engaging the community members like Mr. Alisea that have sustained and maintained these knowledge systems, often against great challenges? So this, these quotes are from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. And we're at a time now where for the first time these International scientific forums are recognizing the critical importance of indigenous people and local people and their knowledge systems for their own security, but also for all of humanity in terms of our ability to adapt to the environmental changes that we're seeing. And at the same time, we have indigenous people's working groups that are also calling for improved standards in terms of respectful relationships between outside researchers and indigenous communities. When this, um, knowledge exchange is taking place and where we're including these communities in knowledge systems. So these images are from Rising Voices in Action Working Group of NCAR UCAR right here in Boulder. And I've been part of this working group through the length of my graduate school and I really draw from the discussions that take place here between indigenous community leaders, indigenous scientists, climate scientists, and um, academic and agency scientists about how we should be doing this because we're navigating a new road that we haven't really taken before. And so uh, you'll see how that's built into the research that I'm doing as well. So the methods that we went about doing this study are often used in medical and policy research. And it's called a systematic review. It's also being used in environmental evidence research. And without going into a ton of detail about the methods, it's a way of gathering all relevant sources of evidence on one topic. And so for this one, it was really important that this was based in practice and that it would be relevant to the people that it would impact the most. So we developed an expert practitioner panel that reviewed the protocol and methods which consist of a series of search terms around certain concepts that are applied to large databases to capture all those relevant sources of evidence. And then with the expert practitioner panel, we also had them guide the protocol and to guide a hand search so we could identify literature that may not be found in academic journals about reports and specific ex inclusion and exclusion criteria. So in this case, it was field studies from all over the world of climate research that were including indigenous knowledge. And then one of the areas that we were most interested in was looking at, again, how community was engaged. So what were the levels of community participation? And I use this scale, this is adapted from participatory ag research that looks at levels of community participation according to who holds decision-making authority in the process. And so this ranges from no participation or contractual on the left. So that could be a community member is contracted to implement a survey that maybe an outside researcher designed for that study. To consultative, so the community is consulted and collaborative where they have some part in the research process but at these stages, an outside researcher may still hold ultimate authority over that process. And then collegial is where that decision-making authority shifts to the community. And it's also a collaborative process. And then I developed this other conceptual level of indigenous. So that could be where the process is centered in an indigenous value system and historical context, like the context I described to you earlier. 
and that they had that authority over what that process should look like at every stage of the research. So it's kind of interesting. I didn't have any field studies that met this criteria, but you know, I'm the first generation in my family entering the sciences this way. And I imagine there are a lot more families that are having that opportunity and access for the first time because of the historical legacy that we come from. And I also hear of more and more research institutions and laboratories that are based in indigenous territories. So I imagine that there will be field studies coming out that do meet this criteria, so I'm leaving it. So keep this scale in mind. And what I'll show you is some of the analysis that I did, um, patterns in space, patterns in time, and patterns in quality in these climate field studies. So first, looking at patterns in space, this is the global distribution of all the field studies that were identified for this analysis. And all in all, there were 125 unique field studies from 140 publications. And so the colors of these data points, again, represent that scale going from this lighter tone of contractual or no community participation. And it's really only these dark brown points that represent a level, and these are averaged out across the length of the research because we looked at different stages in the research. It's really only these dark tones that represent where community might have authority over that process. So what we found is that among these 125 studies, almost 90% practice what could be considered an extractive research model. So indigenous knowledge is accessed from that community by outside researchers, and then the knowledge holders that are contributing that knowledge don't necessarily have any decision about what form that knowledge takes, how it's interpreted, how it's disseminated, or in often cases even have access to those findings. And I would also say, we haven't had time yet, but this map, just looking at this clustering and patterning, patterning of the field sites, invites a lot more research, or maybe someone else's thesis or dissertation work, around why these exist where they do. And that you can see these, these large regional gaps, and a lot of them are climate hotspots where the land is, is impacted, and where we know there's indigenous communities there, and indigenous knowledge systems, but they're not yet being included in climate research, including my own family's region in the Caribbean. So we're looking forward to putting the first data point on that map. These are patterns over time. And what we're looking at here is a general distribution and density in terms, again, of levels of participation going from contractual or none at the bottom up through collegial. This dotted line represents collaborative level research. And then this is looking at three stages in the research. So from the left, from design, through implementation and analysis. And what you can see is that they're more heavily weighted towards the bottom, th towards this contractual or no participation throughout every stage of the research. And it's also interesting looking at this distribution and density in a little higher resolution. So here we're looking at the same scale and the same three stages, design, implementation, and analysis. But these are who is conducting this research. And so A represents, or this lighter colored tone, represents outside academic researchers initiating projects in indigenous communities. And then the mid-range is mutual agreements between outside researchers and indigenous communities. And then C is when indige indigenous community is initiating that project themselves. So here you can see a really different, distinct pattern throughout every stage of the research process. And I should say that this group that are initiated by outside researchers are 71%. So it's the bulk majority of the studies. And that you can see they really just exist from this dotted line below. And they're much heavier in terms of density at the bottom here in these violin plots. And then in mutual agreement, and those initiated by community members, those are the only ones that are really moving up into levels of participation where community has some authority over that research process. And this is throughout the entire length of the study. So here I looked at patterns in quality. And to do that, I developed these indicators for responsible community engagement. And these indicators were developed from existing codes of ethics, such as the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. And there's a US-based climate and traditional knowledge working group that's produced some guidelines around respectful engagement and principles of engagement. So using those sources, I developed six indicators that I look for in each of these studies. 
and I'll move from left to right and go through them. And again, I subgrouped out who was initiating that study, A, outside academic researchers, and mutual agreement, or C, community. And for most of these, we looked at whether or not they were reported. So the darker tone is reported, and in some we looked at a little more detail. So starting at the left, we looked at do community members have access to the findings that are produced in those studies? And then we looked at relevance in terms of are those findings reported in the context of concerns or issues that have been identified by that community? And then we looked at credit. So how are knowledge holders credited for their contributions to the research? And for that, we looked at reported both in terms of a formal acknowledgement and co-authorship. And I think this one is really interesting because you can see this darker tone represents co-authorship with each of these subgroups. And I find that uh, when secondary users are accessing climate data, if that traditional knowledge is published, say, in a journal article, and the author of that article is from outside the community, and that secondary user, like a researcher like myself, goes to cite that study, they reference that knowledge to the author. And so this knowledge is being held in some way by an outside researcher. You can see in the vast majority of the studies, this is maybe 5% of that larger group, that 71% of all climate field studies. So I think that um, we have more to do in discussion just around that one indicator of credit. So the next one we looked at are were ethical guidelines such as free prior and and informed consent reported, and then cause the principle of cause no harm or do no harm in terms of where intellectual property rights or risks addressed in the study, and then whether or not there were outputs or outcomes either actual or proposed for the indigenous community. And so this is where we stand. According to all the sources of evidence we were able to obtain, and the earliest one that we found because climate research is relatively young, was from 1996. And at the time I stopped collecting data was in April of 2016. So that's about 20 years of research. This is where we stand. And if you're like me, it's kind of like, I'm not satisfied with this. And I think it's a real call that, yes, we do need to improve those standards. And we do need to find ways to, to build some kind of ethical standard around responsible research because the, the guidelines and the codes of ethics are not necessarily being reflected in practice. So what I did from here is, in order to, to support that effort, I adapted these indicators into a series of questions. And again, we looked at every stage of the research. So these questions apply to every stage from initiation through design, implementation, analysis, and dissemination. And these questions could be used to guide a researcher who's planning on designing a study or starting a study with a native community, or someone who's reviewing proposals of research studies. And then from presenting these findings at conferences, I found that people that work with local communities are also able to adapt these questions and these indicators to their own work with local knowledge holders that may not be indigenous communities. And that even though we've only done this study in the field of climate research, that researchers from other fields of science and even outside science are also finding this relevant and that if a similar analysis was conducted, the findings, the patterns may also be very similar in other fields. So as of right now, again, I have those resources that these were developed from. And as of right now, um, as of sharing these findings out, there are natural resource departments and agencies that are adopting these questions into their training in the U.S. and in Canada that are finding these relevant. So uh, if some of you may also find them relevant, rather than reading through every single one, I can share these out electronically. And Mike and I are working on a publication that will be open access so that people will be able to use these. So the main takeaway here is that quality and research practice really requires us moving away from this dominant extractive model that we see here to conducting research by and with indigenous community members. And to always consider, regardless of what area we're working in, how our research design influences broader social impacts. So I have a ton of people to thank, including my committee and advisor, some of whom are here, thank you, for guiding this research protocol. And uh, to my family, who's also here, my husband, who has been a huge caretaker for our kids and is also a full-time student and veteran, and we managed to do this together because uh, it took a lot of time 
reading through and working through all those articles, and then funding support from the NSF Graduate Research Fellowship and the CCC Fellowship and the Warner Scholarships. And also my lab mate, Ricky Burrell, who's a bit of our wizard for helping me learn my coding and work on those data visualizations. And then my contact information is here below. So I don't want to end on that, though. I have a question for you <laughs> that I wanted to, to turn back. And you can just take this home with you, or you can respond to it. I wanted to leave some time for discussion and Q&A. And it's really uh, how might you apply or maybe adapt these guidelines in your own research for, to improve the responsible research ethics in your own practice? And how might this improve your integrity as a scientist? And the reason that I ask this is because my daughter, our daughter, who's eight years old in third grade now, is coming home and she's telling me about what she's learning and her experiences. And I'm finding that she's having, you know, mirroring the same experiences that I had in school over 20 years ago. And I'm realizing how little has changed. And I think about that as a scientist in terms of we have this handful of perspectives and voices. And even when our own stories are being talked about in our own histories, they're often coming from the same voices. So there may be faces that look different or voices on sound bites that sound different, but the script is written by the same people. And you can tell when you're from that community and your stories haven't been told. So I think we have that glimpse right here of a small group of people, but it's not just the proportion of voices, it's also the length of time because Everything is going back maybe five centuries, but we have this whole length of time behind us that hasn't been included. This invisible legacy, this invisible history and intellectual heritage that we haven't included. And so as a scientist, I see that as an incomplete data set. <coughs> and that this seminar really isn't just about diversity and inclusion, but it's about doing science better and being better scientists. So I think that in the case of my daughter, I also put a little bit of a call to action at the end of this talk, because in the case of my daughter, I know that her and my son and their generation are going to be facing some of the more severe climate impacts and environmental challenges that we've kind of set into place and the generations before us. And so we're going to need to equip them with all the tools and resources that we can. And those include all of these different forms of science and different forms of data. So I think we all have a role to play in this effort and yeah, I would just leave it at that, that we have some work to do, and this is one small part, but I'd encourage you to continue this discussion in your field and to see how we can support these efforts for the future. So ha home, thank you for your time and hearing my story and giving me this opportunity to share my research, and I'll open it up for discussion and questions. Thank you very much. That was excellent. Can I ask you to go back two slides for your to your questions? Uh, so, do you, here's a question for you. Even though you asked us the question, I think this plays into it. Um, if I took out indigenous, is that okay? Is that does that still stand for you? If I took out the word indigenous? In, the, in their title, responsible re research practice with communities. Yeah. Should it be all communities? And where do you draw the line? Yeah. Well, so when I, I mean, I adapted this specifically for a very unique historical context that I shared at the beginning in terms of indigenous communities. However, the feedback that I've gotten from presenting this is that citizen science and community-based research initiatives and organizations also found this relevant in terms of adapting it to just communities and community engagement. Because we have knowledge holders that are community members that may not be indigenous and hold that historical legacy per se, but I know a lot of rural ranchers and farmers that hold so much knowledge and I could see this being adapted in other fields in that way. So I would say, yes, people are already doing that. Thank you. I think, uh, yeah, uh, my name is Dorian Martinez. I uh, teach in the Ethnic Studies Department and Indigenous Studies. I think that it's not just simply like taking that word out because I actually think there's more complications to it. Yeah. 
because um, I also would actually say that in some ways I want to keep it in even if other communities use it because it's about a process that you do, not just the players, right? Um, and, I, and, and I think that that's important in terms of what this flushes out. And maybe you don't have indigenous in this kind of language in which we're using in this particular research, but you really are looking at how are you reshaping knowledge production and almost giving it then the proper credit to say it is an indigenous framework of knowledge production. So, yeah, you know. That, that's well stated. In fact, is it, is, is it, is it as much about cross-cultural when you enter into a cross-cultural environment that you're the outsider? In other words, it, it seems to me special that it's indigenous. It needs to be protected as such, but I can see other cases where maybe I'm going to another country and doing work, and that seems particularly relevant because I'm outside the knowledge system, as you say. And I just, I would, that's why I said kind of where do you draw the line on this and where does it seem relevant and not? It's certainly perfectly relevant here. It seems well, I think it's it. perfectly relevant everywhere, basically what we want to do. And, you know, I think there's a recent article that I shared with the Zapatistas that you're decolonizing science. So I think it's relevant everywhere. I think part of this though is giving credit then to the systems and processes in which we use to do that decolonizing the science. Yeah, I think it is. Oh, can I interject? Well, I was just going to say, and where, and, 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 and my only question really was, where do we draw the line when we when we talk about that? I mean, is it if it's within culture, if it's rural communities, it's a great. You brought that up, like a farming community, and it seems to be applicable to me. But I just sorry to bring up this. I think it's it's greatly applicable. Totally. I just think again, it's how do we do it, and how do you credit how you. How to be done, but go ahead. Yeah, I guess I did. I'm glad this conversation is taking place, and I hope it continues, because I, I did want to acknowledge to always bring back the. There's a larger context here, and the reason that these were developed and these working groups were developed, the reason we even have a seminar on diversity and inclusion that's even a thing, <laughs> or like a chapter or a class. I mean, imagine if we didn't have to have that. And we have these terms and concepts that are so embedded, so systemic. Like I'm always reading things and it says new world. And I'm thinking, for whom? <laughs> I thought it was just the world, <laughs> you know? And then even in the title of the seminar, Frontiers. And I'm thinking, who are those frontiers for? And so I agree we have other marginalized populations that we'll work with in doing this kind of work that haven't yet been represented. And that the main thing is, it's not just that there, I mean, I often in so many of these studies it said, and we use participatory community-based research methods. But then as we were reviewing it, and Ricky reviewed some for the iterator test, we were looking for the evidence of that and we weren't finding it. Because what they described in practice was a community member held the survey and translated it. But all of the questions were designed from someone who was not from that community. And all of the data that was collected was interpreted by someone who was not from that community. And I can't speak for every community. I can only speak from my own experience. But I have read plenty of textbooks and reports that are very inaccurate <laughs> in terms of how our traditional knowledge and language is represented and what's told about our history and our communities. And if I hadn't been an indigenous scholar, you know, I would have read that Forest Service report or whatever it was and just taken it at face value and stopped there. And then I would have re-recorded what I had read as if it were fact and knowledge. But I knew from my family's oral history that that wasn't the case. I knew that the land tenure history was different than it had been described by first-hand experience, by primary stories and monitors of that land. And I had to look deeper into what that story was. And so these um, guidelines have been developed from that legacy and that imbalance that persisted for five centuries. And I think that does need to be acknowledged. It's more than just a method or a practice. It's around uh, human integrity and scientific integrity. And so, I mean, we could just apply it, but I think we have a responsibility to also acknowledge that legacy 
and where it come from and why indigenous communities and working groups have had to even build and define these guidelines. So I think even if it is adapted to acknowledge that context and to make sure that those stories aren't being retold by the same voices, if that makes sense, <laughs> yeah. Yeah? Thanks, Amik, that was, that was great. I was wondering, you know, is, is this was sort of treated as a checklist. Is, is, are the answers to this, these are co-produced as well? Is that sort of, was that, would that sort of be your vision, your ideal that, that somebody is sitting with members of that community to answer? I mean, I can think like our findings accessible to indigenous community members Right, I mean, the, the sort of, some could do that. It's open access to this, you know. Yeah, they have access to it. And like, well, open access to a woman with no formal education in Northern Kenya is not going to be chasing down journal articles. Um, how, what, how do you envision the ideal process for how these are answered? I think that the, I just want to make sure I understand your question. So, these questions are guiding questions and points of reflection. And I think that we, this is just the beginning and we have a long way to go and as far as how we will address these in practice. However, I think that, so in my own study, this is something I'm implementing in field testing also and recognizing I am going to do a journal article manuscript, peer reviewed manuscript for my dissertation because that's a requirement. However, whether or not it's open <laughs> access, there are maybe two or three members of my community that have collaborated on this project that, with me that will access that language and to which that format will be meaningful. And so that's a responsibility that I take upon myself to consider how my research is benefiting those that have contributed to allow my research to even take place. And that in my own research, I look towards um, cultural and human values like reciprocity. And so I think each person needs to reflect on that in their own being and what that will look like in their process. But I imagine if you are asking these questions, so are they included in my decision to initiate the study? No, why not, you know? Or are they included in the design? And if not, who is that benefiting? And who is that doing disservice to? Because in some cases, maybe everyone, maybe science, like in the context that I shared that. So I, I would leave that up to each of you. I don't want to answer that question for you because I think this is a really important time for each of us to reflect on that process as scientists and our own scientific integrity and the values that we hold in our practice. So yeah, I'm just going to leave it at that. Yes. So it seems like, thank you so much for this incredible talk, first of all. I've just been blown away by it, for sure. Um, and, and building off of what you were just saying, it, it seems like there, the, it, the implications of these, these questions and, and this process and, and doing science that corresponds to our values might mean that oftentimes scientists might have to choose not to do research or choose not to participate in a study that is unethical and not publish that work that is going to fit along that bottom of that diagram that you showed where it's not involving the community and the indigenous communities in all those ways. Does that seem fair to you that the, some of the implications might be to do less science in order to do better science? I think it's historic because I, you know, at the NSF I have to take the responsible research conduct training and the city training and the IRB trainings and we read about all these case studies that were unethical. And those are the examples where they didn't choose not to. And so, you know, a generation or two down the line, they may be looking back on the research that was done now. And we have a lot of research coming out that had deep um, harmful implications for a lot of communities in the U.S. and all over the world that we're just now hearing about. Um, so I think that... I mean, whatever you choose, just remember that will be the legacy that you leave behind. And that we read about those case studies as um, you know, examples of, of bad ethics and bad conduct, and that we're still developing ethical protocols around our work. I think they're much more advanced in the medical fields than in the environmental sciences. But this is as good a time as any to implement them in practice and not be that bad case study later down the line for the researchers who are attending those trainings. Yeah. I 
a question about um, the challenges that might arise to implementing some of these principles based on scale. If your community that you're attempting to collaborate with is perhaps 20,000 individuals, um, and there are your existing hierarchies that you could engage with, like leadership groups, for instance, it might seem logical to target or collaborate with people who have more power in that community. Um, but engaging in a more maybe democratic or just way would be pretty challenging for, you know, hypothetically a small research team. What do you think about those uh, hurdles? I think that I haven't, I mean, the only global scale research I've done is this systematic review. And so I think when you're, I mean, I come from a background in geospatial sciences, so you think about scale and resolution, and you need to have data that's appropriate to scale to be applied to a certain scale. So it's kind of a similar concept. So at least in this global study, I had international collaborative working groups like the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People had international representation over a long period of time to develop these, uh, these guidelines. And so I would say just look at existing frameworks that are already out there. And since I'm not as familiar with doing certain projects on that scale, look at people that are doing it and doing it well. And that handful of studies here so the next steps from this research is really to look at this handful of studies that do have these high levels of indicators and see what are they doing in practice and where are they and who's doing them and, and to follow up with them and to hold them up as models of effective and ethical research practice. So I would say see what's out there at that scale. Make sure your data and resources that you're drawing from match the resolution that you're thinking about applying it to. Yep. Actually, Jen had a question. No, I'll come to you. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you so much. That was fantastic. You're welcome. Um, I'd like to, to hear a little bit more about your thoughts about what we could do as a university and as a department in Warner College to promote these ideas, um, and also specifically around returning results or sharing results or co-producing results, analyzing data with communities where all of our students are working. Um, I know at my former institution, we had a small grant for students to return and share data and learn more about how the data might be, that they've analyzed, might be interpreted by communities. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering what else, what, what possibilities do you see? Yeah, I have a few ideas. <laughs> Thank you for being here, Dr. Manfredo. <laughs> So I think there's a few things that are in place at other institutions that are also working through this process that we're in right now historically that we can learn from. And we were just so privileged to have Dr. Robin Kimmerer here as our distinguished speaker. And she shared a lot of really excellent examples that they're already implementing in SUNY. And then is it um, Northern Colorado University in Boulder? Do you remember the one that? So there's a lot of academic institutions now that are honoring and acknowledging the historical and land legacies where they stand. So is anyone aware of whose indigenous territory CSU sits on today? Does anyone know? Arapaho, Ute, Northern Cheyenne. There's, there's even more that actually pass through this territory. And does anyone know the original place name of Fort Collins before it was Fort Collins or the Kashlapooter or Horsetooth? Does anyone know? Why don't we know that? Isn't that, like, shouldn't every child have access to that kind of knowledge and history of where we stand? So there are, at the K through 12 level, Montana, where, uh, where I used to live and where I grew up much of my life and did my undergrad, was the first state to fund Indian Education for All. And Indian Education for All is this incredible federal initiative where tribes within that state are provided funding to develop their own curriculum in every subject of learning that is then provided to all K through 12 public school students, regardless of their heritage or background. And then Wyoming is the second state to now fund it. So I think they're in the process of developing it right now. 
So why not have Colorado be next? Because I don't want to see my daughter having to filter through these other narratives and come home with homework. OK, we're going to talk about the first peoples, and you're going to envision your life as a colonist. <laughs> and I'm like, here we go. You know, It's really interesting for our family. And um, so that's K through 12. And then a lot of the universities have included, in addition to the state and the American flag, the flags of the nations on which their territory resides. And when their president or the heads of their department open their speeches, they acknowledge the land where they stand and the intellectual and historic contributions of the indigenous peoples where they're at. And then there are so many other steps we could take. Um, I'd like to implement some of the initiatives that are taking place at other universities here and have CSU lead the way in that effort. And of course, to see more native faculty and students so that we, I mean, it's such a gift and a privilege to have students that have those diverse experiences and those diverse perspectives in the classroom with us that we can learn from, but to also support the work that they'll have to undertake to carve that space to bring narratives in that won't be reflected in most of our textbooks and resources that we have. And I think, I mean, on a personal level, I'm getting ready to graduate. And I'm doing all of this kind of side work on behalf of my community that I know that we need and that I have the access up an opportunity and skills now to provide, but none of it's really recognized in terms of my dissertation work. And I would love to see, I mean, I have three manuscript journals that I'm going to produce that I know they, uh, they'll benefit in my communities in some ways over some length of time and some secondary way, but I'd like to benefit my community right now. And so all the initiatives that I'm taking for that effort aren't necessarily recognized for my um, portfolio and my dissertation requirements. And I would love to have an opportunity to do that work in a way that benefits my community equally to academic community. Like NSF, they, they really call for intellectual merit and broader impacts. So I'd like those broader impacts to directly impact my community and the communities that I work with. So that's one that I put out there. And there's so many others, but we don't have time. So we could talk later. And I think there's a lot of other examples we can learn from. Not just here, but in First Nations too, in New Zealand, Aotearoa, and uh, in Australia, and in the other colonial countries that are working through this legacy. Yeah. I was going to ask one more question. Yeah, With the little time we have left, can you, you said we want to add that data point in what it can, right? Yeah. Well, can you give us the three minute elevator speech of what that looks like? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Just highlighting what, you know, how, you're, how you're applying those principles in your, in your other work. Yeah. So I kind of want to go back and show you in pictures. It looks like this. It looks like this, and it looks like this. So the youth in the Caribbean use textbooks that are produced on the mainland or in Europe and different places. And so they don't really describe the local ecology, and they don't include our indigenous language about bagua, for example, which is a storm that comes off the water. And what kind of indicators we observe when a hurricane's coming through and where the sources of fresh water are when your water's turned off or how to grow foods that are adapted to drought. But Mr. Alasea does and this elder in Kiskeya does. And so what we're doing is rather than an outside scientist or researcher coming in, we're developing a model where these youth are the researchers in our study. And these youth, three of them, have presented their findings to state-level scientists at this point in the labs. And that in addition to digital climate data sources and maps, they have their primary data sources of climate knowledge. And so finding a language where the youth can bring in their cultural embedded science concepts and also academic sciences. So we're field testing that model and then sharing it out in some of the unique methods that we've been able to use to adapt that process so that the community members are researching and then 
when I'm finished with my dissertation, the research hasn't ended because their data sources live in their communities and they're still maintaining that connection. And as Mike and some of his former students pointed out, the greatest threat right now to loss of indigenous knowledge is that break in transmission of that knowledge between generations. So our study is really just supporting that bridge to pass that knowledge down so that they're equipped with all the resources they need. Was that three minutes? I think this was Great. a test of Not some good. kind. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thanks for asking that. Okay, all right, I think we'll, we'll finish up there. Thank you again, Tony, very much.